Esther has a number of uh, things to say to us in the first chapter, so we'll be looking at quite a few different themes as we uh, go through. But one of the things that Esther talks about is ideal relationships, and uh, sometimes the relationships that we're in are less than ideal. Other times the relationships that we're in are ideal, but we just have a different idea of what what things should be going on, what should be the ideal. We think, I should be having bonbons now, and, and, and I'm not. Uh, and uh, there are times when our expectations don't match reality, and it's because we could be doing something better. There are times when our expectations are just wrong. They're, they're not in alignment with what is actually uh, good for us. Uh, many of us don't understand the, uh, the way the world works is that the easier that we have it, the worse off it gets for us because we, we don't get stronger. Uh, and so we, in our desire for comfort, often pursue things that make us weaker and have a life less than what we would desire. Anyway, Esther addresses a lot of different things. We're going to start in the first verse of Esther 1, uh, and we see that the king uh, who was uh, in charge ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, uh, East Africa, uh, as well as India, a large swath of land, the Middle East, India, and uh, part of Africa, all under this one person's domain. And uh, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. So he decides, everybody needs to see the best of what, what I've got, the best of the best. From all these 127 different provinces, we'll get uh, the best food, we'll get the best entertainers, we'll get the best ideas, and we'll put it on display. So he did that. Uh, the army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present, while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the pomp of his majesty. So many of you know, in Russia on May Day, they parade out some of the uh, military and uh, there are various places where they do this for an hour or a day, uh, and, and that's not what this was. Some of you have seen a World Expo. Can I see the hands of people who've gone to a World's Fair or a World Expo? Not that many of us, wow, wow. Seattle was great, Vancouver was off the charts awesome, Spokane was uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they're uh, not just in the U.S., they're around the world, and uh, they're worth traveling to because uh, for a period of a number of months, you get to see the best of what each of these nations have to offer. And so they, uh, China probably has a display, Russia has a display, Czechoslovakia, some of the smaller nations have displays, uh, and you get to see a lot of the world just in one neighborhood. So that's about what this king was doing. Uh, he did it for many days, and if you're reading along, you discover that many means, yeah, quite a few, 180. So what the king was doing was essentially a world's fair. He was getting the best of his whole empire together and putting it on display for six months. So people could come and see it for six months. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done a six-month party, but it takes a lot of help, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And so at the end of this six-month party, uh, the king decided to reward the workers, the people who had been help putting this on. So uh, when the 180 days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the citadel in, the, in his kingdom, in the main area, both great and small, a banquet lasting seven days. So this is the after party. They've put on this massive World's Fair Expo. They put on the main event. Everybody's gone home. And now for just the workers, they're putting on a seven-day party. So this is during the seven-day party. 
in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Drinking was by flagons without restraint. Um, I don't know what your friends are like. When my friends drink without restraint, it's not a good thing. Uh, you really want someone who's drinking to have some sense of boundaries of, no, this is too much. Uh, and usually, they should have quit earlier, right? Uh, but, but someone who has no restraint, um, that's bad when alcohol's involved. Uh, I saw a young woman with no restraint uh, going into a yogurt shop and uh, this was a place where they intentionally make the nozzles f uh, just dump out product as fast as possible because they charge by the ounce or half ounce and, and want you. And so she got $10 worth of yogurt um, and didn't really have the money for it. And who can eat $10 worth of frozen yogurt anyway? Um, bad enough when you're doing that with something that won't affect your brain chemistry. But when you're consuming alcohol, alcohol will change what your ability to think, your ability to think straight. And so there are now, everybody in the, all the workers are drinking without restraint for seven days. Uh, the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one desired. That might sound really good at first until you think, as each person desired after seven days of drinking. This king is a king that likes to party uh, and that doesn't really think through everything, right? Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for all the women in the palace. So that was just for the guys. Uh, so the women weren't invited to this drunken brawl, and many of them probably said, thank goodness. But the queen gave a party for all the women who had been helping for the 180 days. So all the women who had been working that time, they also had a party. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring the queen before the king so that he could show off to the people and the officials her beauty. Uh, I don't know how uh, this strikes you, but I can guarantee you that not everybody has the same visceral reaction in this room. And around the world, as people read this story, there will be a wide variety of takes about the morality of this, the ethics of this, the virtue of this, whether it's a good thing or not, uh, depending on people's culture. One of the things that we're going to do over the next few weeks is read about a particular culture in a particular time. And the, the thing that we'll discover is that they dealt with the same topics we're dealing with today. They just had a different perspective on them. Some of the things, ideas that they had might be better than some of your ideas. Some of your ideas might be quite a bit better than the, some of the things that they did. Uh, the idea of a uh, beauty pageant for women in the United States has uh, decade by decade a different uh, acceptability in the culture. So what was acceptable in 1960 is not quite as acceptable in 2010 or 2020. Uh, and standards change, ideas about how people should behave change, ideas about what is fair change. Uh, but in this culture, uh, the drunken king invited his wife to come and parade her beauty before a group of guys who'd been drinking for seven days. And uh, some of you women might think, oh, I would so love to do that. Uh, and some of you might be thinking more on the lines like Queen Vashti. Uh, there is no way I'm going to go show off my beauty before those people. 
Uh, and that's what the queen decided. And so uh, from our 21st century cultural America, uh, this queen will be a hero to many people. And, uh, and one of the things that this story illustrates is that if you want to take a stand that is against the culture, there will be consequences. If everybody is going one direction and someone to come, wakes up and decides, oh, we're, we're headed the wrong way, and turns around and starts going the other direction, they may start a movement. They may pick up some people who say, yeah, that's right. We are going the wrong way. But they will be going against the current of everybody else for some time. The, the first person to have a new idea, to have a new direction, will face some opposition. This is true in the scientific community, it's true in the medical community, it's true in every community, whether we're talking about something like um, beauty and talent and, um, and how genders act and all of these things. If you start a new direction, you can be right and still face tremendous opposition because everybody else is going the other direction. Verse 12, Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. This was a kind of king who executed people who didn't follow his commands. So uh, her stand, while courageous, was also going to have some consequences, which when she took the stand were unknown. But she knew probably how far this could go. But she refused to come. This enraged the king and his anger burned within him. As we go through this story over the next few weeks, you will discover that this king has a lot of anger over a lot of different issues. So anger was just one of the parts of his personality. If you've had in your family system someone who is always angry or angry a lot, you know that a lot of times the whole family dynamic uh, gets centered around uh, either helping this person to dial down or fleeing when the person is out of control. Or, but, but the anger can set up a dynamic that causes everyone in that family system to be reacting out of self-preservation. Uh, and the king was a person like that. Then the king consulted with the sages who knew uh, the laws. So another thing we'll discover about this king is that he does very little on his own. He doesn't seem to have any idea on his own, but he can, at least he consults people around him who can give him advice. So he asked them, according to the law, what's to be done with, to Queen Vashti? And uh, the advisor who speaks up says, you know, this queen, what she's done is so great. We should really let everybody know that everyone should stand up. And that's not what he said, right? Uh, no, he said, uh, not only has Queen Vashti insulted you, done wrong to you, but to all the officials and all the people who are in the provinces, everybody's going to hear about this. People have been talking about this party that has been going on for 180 days. And if it ends like this, it's going to be the talk of all the kingdom that the queen refused to come when you summoned her on the last day of the after party. Uh, this deed of the queen will be made to, known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, and there will be no end of contempt and wrath. Now, I'm going to do something dangerous, which is to talk about four or five different perspectives in the same message. And some of you need one of the four. The trouble is that others of you need a different one. So I'm not going to make all of you happy all of the time. First off, I'm going to start 
with this charge and talk about the part of it that is actually good and accurate. If you have contempt for someone, it is one of the primary signals that your relationship is in trouble and may end. Contempt is an emotion that is not helpful to you or to others. It is a level of disgust that says, I'm greater, better than this other person. So it devalues the other person and it holds them in low regard. So instead of seeing the other's person need, other person's need and helping them, having compassion for them, understanding them, having empathy for them, it, a person with this attitude will seek to work for their harm. And the other person, and, and it's uh, very dangerous psychologically and just statistically, if you have contempt for someone, it's bad news for your relationship. If someone has contempt for you, it's bad news statistically for your relationship. What Jesus calls us to is to love each other, even our enemies. So there are people who do not deserve our love that Jesus calls us to love. That does not mean don't have boundaries. Queen Vashti, uh, in a moment, may not have had any contempt. This is just the charge against her, right? So I'm just pausing on this to talk about, not about Queen Vashti or her stand, but to talk about the attribute of contempt by itself. <clears throat> if you have contempt for someone, it would be helpful to ask Jesus to help you to rethink um, and react what you're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because Jesus has compassion and love for the person that you have contempt for. So you're not seeing them through the eyes of Jesus. And it may be that you still need to have some boundaries. It may need you, mean you need to leave. It may uh, you may need to uh, take some difficult stands, but contempt itself is not helpful. All right, so that's one of the perspectives we'll talk about. Second, this is a charge about Queen Vashti from someone who does not like what she's just done. The charge may not be true. So contempt doesn't help relationships, but Queen Vashti may have no contempt. She might actually have a lot of honor for her drunken husband. And just know that in this setting, doing what he asked isn't going to be helpful. So there are times when you can be charged with something that is untrue. And there are uh, occasions where it's helpful to let the truth be known. But in general, trying to defend your character is less helpful than other things you could do. So some of the times when we are slandered and when someone charges us with something that is simply not true, the best thing you can do is to continue staying the course that you're on and doing what is good and righteous, even though others may start to believe the charges against you, which are untrue and unjust. Third, about this one person's charge. He's actually right that when someone does something unusual, it's an example. Sometimes it's a good example, sometimes it's a bad example, but it's an example and other people notice and sometimes people copy it. They say, yeah, I do have the ability to say no. I do have the ability to not participate in everything that is against my values. I can choose. Uh, this deed of the queen will be made known to all women. So the advice to the king was, if it pleases the king, let a royal order go out uh, from the king 
but Vashti is to never again come before the king and let the king give her royal position to another one who's better than she is. For the queen, the act that she took was costly. After three years, or however long she's been queen with this king, she may have decided, yeah, but it's worth it, he's worthless. Uh, we don't know that part of the story. Uh, but it, uh, it was costly for her. She lost her position. And, uh, and there are times when the stands that you take will be costly. It's worth it to have your mind made up in advance about whether you're willing to pay the price or not. When the decree made by the king was proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, uh, this is still the advisor talking to the king. All women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. And just in case you think this is good advice, it's very difficult to legislate respect, to order someone to respect you. If you're trying it with a child, uh, it's probably not going to work. If you're trying it with an adult, it's definitely not going to pay off in the way that you hope. So the king sent letters declaring that every man should be the master in his own house. Isn't that a nice story for today? Uh, I bet some of you want to read the uh, rest of what we're going to be going through in this week, um, especially this irritating little verse uh, and what the Bible says about it. We'll be walking through this this week uh, in our Bible study. Just in general, what does the Bible say about this particular last phrase? It says we should love each other. Husbands should love their wives. Wives should love their husbands. And love uh, overlooks a lot and has compassion on a lot and causes the other person to rise up higher. If you're ready for a change in your life, uh, it would be helpful if you ask Jesus to be your Lord. Ask for the Holy Spirit to fill you. Read the Bible every day. It has information you cannot find anywhere else. Find a church where you can grow in faith. If it's this one, we would be just thrilled about that. But we want the best for you. So wherever uh, you go, we want that to be a blessing. And do what Jesus tells you to do. Uh, homework for some of you. Uh, it would be good to figure out who are the people you're looking down on, despising, not honoring. Maybe you don't exactly hold them in contempt, but who are the people that you aren't honoring? And do something good for them. Uh, be helpful if it was someone not in this community, because for this week, the people in this community, if, some, if you do something nice for them, they're going to think, does that mean you held me in contempt all this time? So uh, try and do it from someone out, outside here who hasn't heard this message. All right, we're going to take a moment for prayer. Jesus, we're so grateful for the way that your word can intersect our lives in so many different ways and can help challenge us to become the people you've called us to be. When we see good examples and when we see bad examples, we, we can in all of those things, look at the good and the bad in our lives and remember that we desire above all else to follow you and to let you be Lord Jesus and to let you, Holy Spirit, direct our paths. So we're so grateful for your presence with us. We're thankful that you have mercy for the times that we have failed in the past and the times we might fail in the future. Uh, thank you for guiding us. And thank you for being with people today who need your consolation. We praise you. Amen.